great question. In really close relationships, like close romantic relationships, if somebody's securely attached, a grown-up is securely attached, and their partner is ambivalently attached, or avoidantly attached, over a period of five years, the ambivalently attached person will become securely attached, or the avoidantly attached person will become securely attached. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two, Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com, and as always, it's my honor and pleasure to be here with you on another autoimmune hour. You can find over 480 plus episodes over at understandingautoimmune.com or on most of the audio podcasts and the video podcasts places that you like. (laughs) You'll find it under the autoimmune hour or understanding autoimmune, either one. And I am so excited because we have a return guest. I always am mesmerized by her (laughs) and all the wisdom she shares with us. And A lot of her wisdom has been a major part of my healing, my understanding about how the body does what it does, why it does what it does. (laughs) So it's not just getting to understanding maybe the physical symptoms of autoimmune, okay, take an aspirin, you'll feel better in the morning kind of thing. Here again tonight with Sarah Payton, yep, the amazing Sarah Payton, we're going to dive and dig even deeper into some more of what, I'm going to put in air quotes, we'll see if Sarah likes these air quotes are not root causes or <laughs> what's underneath the some of the obvious symptoms right let me read her bio for you because many of you already know her but if you don't know sarah yet buckle up you're in for a great ride sarah payton she's a certified trainer of nonviolent communication and a neuroscience educator i love her because she's able to bring all of the latest in brain science trauma science living well science <laughs> and she studies all the research. I'm, I'm telling you, this gal really geeks out on the big word kind of research. And what I love about her, she's able to bring it and um, parse it down to where I can understand it. So <laughs> that's what I love about her because she really integrates brain science and the use of resonant language to awaken and sustain self-compassion, particularly in the face of difficult issues like self-condemnation, self-disgust, self-sabotage, or health issues, I like to add to her bio. Yeah. She teaches and lectures internationally and is the author of the Your Resident Self book series. I have to say that really slow because some people think I'm saying resident, which I'm not. I'm saying resident. <laughs> I know every time I transcribe these, the transcription AI thing thinks it's resident. Anyway, she is also the co-author alongside with Dr. Roxy Manning of the Anti-Racist Heart, a Self-Compassion and Activism Handbook. And I just love that too. We've interviewed both Sarah and uh, Dr. Roxy on that topic. So go to understandingautoimmune.com and just put in either of their names and you'll find those in our archives because those are pretty awesome too. But I want to get to it. I don't want to waste any more time introducing this amazing person. Welcome, Sarah. I'm so happy to see you today. Thank you. I am so happy to be here today. Now, I'm really excited. We were chatting offline, shall I say, (laughs) and the topic of attachment came up. I've had several other guests on, and I just like getting multiple viewpoints about it. We've talked about attachment was your word for it as we were discussing it, and I would love to know a little bit more about how you define attachment. I got the idea from our discussion But for the audience and everybody, how do you define attachment? Yeah, I like to think about this sort of whole world of research that has been done into what's the impact of behavior between mom and baby on babies then 
immune system, nervous system, ability to self-regulate, ability to make friends, ability to find solid romantic partners. It all begins really early. Now, when I was little, the whole idea was that if things went wrong in ages zero to three, you were messed up for life. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. We both have discovered that is not true. <laughs> you, but you answered my question because the interview we had with Michaela Giles the other day was fascinating too. And it touched on this topic. And I remember reflecting back when I was raising my own children, the pediatrician and the conventional wisdom said, if you've got a fussy baby, let him cry it out. Yeah, so that creates a whole nother series now that I'm older and I have this guilt complex, but we won't go there. We'll just talk about <laughs> attachment, right? <laughs> I just want to test, pause for a minute with cry it out. And you and I may have talked about this before because it's so important to name it. But I think it helps us to forgive our parents for their Dr. Spock supported ideas about letting babies cry it out and pediatrician supported ideas about letting babies cry it out. Dr. Spock was writing his book coming out of this very repressive and violent reaction to crying babies, where people used to hit crying babies. So what he was trying to do by getting people to let their babies cry it out was to, to stop the abuse. Well, and that reframes it in a much better yeah, frame. It's okay, yeah. like stopping that terrible cycle. Exactly. So Somewhat I think that incrementally. brings us a breath of fresh air into the whole understanding of these waves of child rearing. So there's <laughs> this repressive, don't touch your baby, because I didn't want us to hit them. <laughs> and then that the makes sense in that context. <laughs> Nowadays, <laughs> it makes no sense. And I, <laughs> exactly. So and now we're starting to go, oh, if you can be with your crying baby with, and be a soothing and responsive presence is going to help their nervous system and their attachment and their immune system for the rest of their lives. So we just, we learn these new things and figure out better ways that lead us away from child abuse and away from child neglect and into what we're really looking for is actual real relationality, which is what we're going to be needing more and more in a world where AI is starting to seep into everything, which is not real relationality, really precious that we're going to be starting to understand about person-to-person -person relationships and that when we allow ourselves to be really fundamentally changed by each other, we're starting to move toward what scientists call co-regulation, which is an enormous part of attachment. It's this concept that we, for years, scientists have been thinking about emotions as something that happens inside one person. If you oh, have emotions are so contagious. I know. I can do it just watching a rom-com movie and get emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But then in the scientist's view, you're responsible for your reaction to the rom-com movie. You have to figure out how to get calm again after you've wept. When the yeah, although sometimes those weepings feels good, but that's another story. Yeah, yeah no, I absolutely. agree. <laughs> yeah. Do you agree with that, that you're responsible for self-regulating then? I'm aware that this is the dominant idea, that we become good grown-ups when we're really good at taking care of our own emotions without burdening anybody else. That's the dominant culture's idea about emotions. Okay, and... <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people that their self-regulating is like masking instead of yeah. buying it out or yeah. having a calm conversation with, hey, here's a boundary. They'll just swallow it. Or, yeah, swallow it or turn to addictions in order to manage it, addictions and compulsions in order to manage all that stuff that's happening inside of a person that's actually supposed to be, it's not supposed to be spilling out and hurting other people we're supposed to be able to talk about it <laughs> and instead of coming home and slamming cupboards we're supposed to be able to come home and say 
Oh, hun, I had a horrible day today. I feel sad and angry and frustrated and so upset. And I think I just need to put my head in your lap for a little minute. Or I think I just need to sit back to back for a little minute and feel your body with me. These kinds of radical accompaniment of one another and requests for accompaniment of one another and telling each other about how we're doing instead of just acting it out. This is all the territory that's created and developed by experiences of secure attachment. To get us back to our subject. (laughs) I want to go tangential again. So everybody, here we go. (laughs) What I just heard was beautiful. And I have people in my world that respond to that because we've all been trained similarly. So we know exactly what that means. However, I'm thinking of other people in my world that if you come to them with, oh, I've had a hard day, they say something like, how, tell me about it. And then they try to solve it. (laughs) So, How do you begin the conversation if the other person is very open and and not resistant to it, but they just don't get it? They don't. They've never been exposed to it. I want to don't get it because I, when I've explained it to people, they often that are open or often get it. But if they've never been exposed to it, how do you start that conversation to say, hey, sometimes I just need to talk and I need someone just to hold a safe space for me, and other times I'll tell you when I need your help figuring it out. Yeah. Oh gosh, it's such a good question. And yeah, I know. I, what I just said was pretty blunt. <laughs> <laughs> it was more of a two by four. I know Sarah will really make it look soft and pretty and nice. <laughs> you and I have talked a lot about unconscious contracts. So here's the problem. If we've got somebody who really wants to fix us, then what they've usually got is an unconscious contract that is at play that kind of puts them into a trance state that makes it impossible for them to do something different, even if we are to ask them. Even if we say, please, honey, be quiet. No, don't try to fix me. Just stroke my head right now, or just hold my hand, or just put your back to my back. We're giving them something to do, and then... My little word nerd wants to pop out here for a second. I said fix it, and you said fix you. Is it? Is Are they really wanting to fix us or are they it's so individualized i'm just thinking about the nuance between someone in your life that (laughs) wants to fix it (laughs) whatever is causing you pain yes yes maybe i'm just being more self-relevatory than i necessarily want to be but when my husband comes home and he's having a hard time i don't want to fix the thing he's having a hard time about i want to fix him So that he's, I mean, I don't feel like I'm going to be able to get in there and change his work situation, but I just, I want to restructure his brain so that he doesn't have to be depressed. I want to fix him. So it might be more like me rather than (laughs) the joys of having a neuroscientist in your world. (laughs) You have the most awesome husband, by the way. (laughs) He is a sweetie. Yeah. So then here we are with attachment. How is this connected to attachment? This is connected to attachment because each person will have their own attachment style, which means that they'll have their own tendency to respond to our experiences of having a hard day. So if we've got somebody who's pretty securely attached, then their unconscious contracts are not going to get in the way of them actually hearing us and hearing what we need. And our ability to receive their warmth will also be really impacted by our attachment style. So, for example, I have a very good friend who's more securely attached than I am. I am a little bit avoidantly attached. And everybody's a little bit of everything. But when I'm having a hard time and I'm crying, I don't want want anybody to touch me. I'm like very tightly held. And I'm like, no, don't touch me. And so he was with me and I started to cry and he said, oh, can I touch your foot? And I said, no, don't touch me. (laughs) Then afterwards, I just felt so sad that I had done that. And I practiced, I actually practiced for six to eight months before he was, we were visiting again. 
And I started to cry. And he said, I touch your foot. And I've been practicing and practicing to move towards secure attachment so that I wasn't rebuffing someone who genuinely wanted to reach out to me. And this time I was able to say, yes, you can touch my foot. <laughs> because I'd been practicing, I knew that my resistance to being touched wasn't uh, any kind of truth. It was this foundational cellular attitude and set of contracts that told me that I was supposed to take care of my pain all by myself. So it's like working on that. So that my friend could offer me comfort and I could accept it. So that felt like a little bit of a triumph. So he's offering from a secure place, but he also, in his secure attachment, when I said, no, don't touch me, he was like, okay. He was a little startled, but he ended up being ju just fine with it because he's worked really hard on his attachment stuff too. And part of what happens with secure attachment we're actually really listening to each other. And we're listening for those deep intentions of love and care. So that's like the coolest, best thing. It's really good for our immune system. It's really good for our, for our uh, autonomic nervous system. It creates these juicy, wonderful connections between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system where the prefrontal cortex can reach in like a good parent and reach for the crying baby that is us and to really hold us, but also let other people be a part of that holding. Now, if you're more the way I was when I said, oh, no, don't touch me, that is called avoidant attachment. And in avoidant attachment, we actually use, we like, create a buffer in our nervous system that's like an insulation layer that stops other people from coming too close to us. So if we're the sort of person who, who thinks I have to do it all myself, I'm responsible for taking care of my own pain, I the, the lone hero is my hero, I'm going to follow on the path of the lone horse rider the lone Western hero is, is the pinnacle of, of goodness. This person can take care of themselves. They don't need anybody else. That's avoidant detachment. And we create avoidant detachment. We create this sort of buffer or insulation layer in our nervous systems in order to manage a child's world, a baby's world, where there's quite a bit of attention for us. We're, we're well cared for. We're fed or our diapers are changed. That room is a good, comfortable temperature. There's thoughtfulness about toys and playing and there's a good schedule. And there's just a lot of thoughtfulness about what does a baby need physically. But an avoidantly attached parent really this is not a conscious decision, but an avoidantly attached parent doesn't pick up a crying baby. They don't hear a crying baby the same way a securely attached parent does. So when we put this insulation layer around ourselves in our avoidant attachment, and if we have avoidant attachment, it's very likely that our parents had avoidant attachment because it gets transmitted in over 85% of cases. We inherit our parents' attachment styles. They can have two different attachment styles. If you remind me, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But we'll inherit the attachment style of the person who we're in relationship with and reconstruct it for ourselves. The mother then, if it's an avoidant mother, doesn't really think it's important to respond to a crying baby. And the avoidant mother also is too busy to really stop and appreciate celebration and joy. So the two things that we're really insulating ourselves from as avoidant babies, we're insulating ourselves from the disappointment of nobody catching us in our sadness and nobody being with us in our joy. So then we take that and we move on with it. I remember when I was studying facial expressions and it took me eight months 
to begin to see sadness on people's faces in the photographic test that I was doing. I kept interpreting sadness as fear. How interesting. Yeah. We're ch- our brains are changed. We're not, we don't know. We don't know. And then fear, there's another really interesting thing about fear. So we can maybe go there. Yes. Well, the fascinating thing to me, though, is I want to make sure that people aren't feeling, oh, I'm doomed. We can re-parent ourselves or reteach ourselves or, or change our attachment style. Yeah, the happiest thing that we know about the brain is that those fibers of secure attachment, which run from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala, are the most happy to grow of any fibers that we've got in the human brain. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> You're like, oh my goodness, I don't want to be doomed. <laughs> <laughs> so as we age, we definitely lose neural material in our temporal lobes. If you're having more trouble finding your car keys or your glasses or where you parked your car than ever before, then you can say, yes, I am losing neural matter in my temporal lobes. But we don't lose neural matter in our attachment circuits. And I think this is the root of the idea that old people are wise because we grow and grow these very sweet, if we're having good experiences with other people, we grow and grow these very sweet neural connections between our prefrontal cortex and our amygdala, no matter how old we are. So we can be avoidantly attached and we can grow into secure attachment. We can be ambivalently attached and we can grow into secure attachment. We can be disorganizedly attached and we can begin to heal towards towards secure attachment. So you named a few of them, avoidant, disorganized. What are the different categories? There are two ways of looking at attachment. And one of them is adult attachment styles. And one of them is attachment styles from infancy. I like working with the attachment styles from infancy because that feels like they're still alive in me. (laughs) The adult ones feel like there's a, a, a little bit of a remove on them. So I go with the infant attachment style information and find it really effective to work with people with that. There's secure attachment, and that's both that's secure and it's organized. We're predictable in our secure attachment. And then we have two more styles that's that are organized and predictable, and that's avoidant attachment, which we started to talk about with the insulation layer. And we have ambivalent attachment, where there's no insulation layer whatsoever. We're just taken into the emotional attachment of whoever we're with. We travel, we move into that, into their emotions. And we- Like we're reflecting and- We're uh, merging. Soaking up there. If they're (laughs) avoided, all of a sudden we become avoidant. We move to another person and they're ambivalent. We become ambivalent. Yeah, we can. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. Yeah, we're very fluid and it depends on- the other person and the way we interact with them, what kind of attachment style will come out of us when we're with them. But in our ambivalent attachment, for example, (laughs) you've got a kid who's sad and you're just like devastated with them. Like (laughs) your emotion is even bigger than your kid's emotion. You're like, Oh my God, my child is sad. It's so hard to recover. So that's ambivalent attachment is where we're carried away by somebody else's emotions. We can do it as a mom with a baby. We can be completely blown out by our kids' emotions, or we can lean into our child's nervous system and require that they accompany us in our emotional stuff. I have a strange backdoor question because that brought yeah. up that ambivalent, brought up a friend of mine who I'll just call dramatic. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Somebody, if I'm noticing that and I regulate myself differently, will that kind of energetically, they'll start to regulate differently? Is that what you're saying about the ambivalent <laughs> That's side? That's a great question. In really close relationships, like close romantic relationships, If somebody's securely attached, a grown-up is securely attached, and their partner is ambivalently attached or avoidantly attached, over a period of five years, the ambivalently attached person will become securely attached, or the avoidantly attached person will become securely attached. 
That's and because they're starting to feel safe, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. That's right. It's hard to be anything but securely and organizedly attached when you feel safe. Wow. That is yeah. fascinating. How, I, uh, side note, how'd they discover five years? That's fascinating they, to me. They tracked, they did uh, big surveys uh, of uh, of adult and had the partners do attachment style tests and then went back and tested them again every year. And this so, reminded me of my friend who trains horses and sometimes she gets horses that have been pretty damaged from yeah. poor ownership or other things like that. I, I don't think it takes five years for that, but I was just thinking about that, that her repetitive calmness is in some ways, in the long term, it is a retraining, but all it, I think she, her repetitive calmness just continues to calm the horse down more and more. Yeah. So calmness is also contagious. That the yeah, yeah. more steady, as she makes sure she always walks the same way, she says hello the same way. Mm. So then the horse begins to, not that I'm comparing There's, to horses, but. No, we are just like horses and just like cats and just like dogs. All of any animal that's closely connected to humans does this attachment style stuff too. We see it with our kittens and with our puppies. Okay. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about how she's taken some pretty uh, rascally horses who people said, what do you give it up? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just by repetitive, same demeanor, mm. calmness, breathing. So she becomes predictable. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Very predictable. Yeah. yeah. And that's huge for creating secure attachment with with an animal and with a human, it turns out. But here's the interesting thing. If you're too calm, then you're avoidant. Wow. Well, I was thinking from my point of view, there were times, especially as before I learned all this, and I'm still learning, <laughs> as you guys know, but in my growing pattern there, that I would get annoyed with people that were too calm. It's like, exactly. well, she was upset as I am. Because they're avoidant. <laughs> They're avoidant. They're in their little buffer of okay. insulation and they're not actually responding to us. When we're crying, we don't want somebody to, sometimes we do, but what we really need is somebody to go, oh, honey, of course that was hard. Can I just sit with you in this being hard? And sometimes we want them to then say, and it's going to be okay. I know it's going to be okay. <laughs> Which is also a little avoidant and a little fixy, but sometimes we like that. We get to ask for what we want. Yeah. <laughs> so this is fascinating to me. I just find that it's amazing to me how pliable our brains are and how when we first started this conversation, I'm just thinking, oh no, <laughs> I'm doomed. <laughs> but I, I'm really getting hope now that the, yeah. you can even retrain those sorts of things. I know they talk about oh, as you get older to take up a hobby that you haven't ever done before and all of that, but it's obvious you, you can retrain all parts of your brain. Yes. Take up a hobby you've never done before and take up a resonance. <laughs> take up to grow these wonderful fibers. Now, explain resonance, because it. I want to make sure they don't think that they have to move to Italy or something. I always get comments and things like, what word are you really saying? And she did not say take a different resonance. She just does it in Italy. <laughs> Explain resonant language for those who aren't familiar. And we've got several shows where Sarah goes through it in much greater detail. You can search for it on uh, understandingautoimmune.com. But Sarah, share what it is. These fibers of attachment are largely in the right hemisphere, running between the right prefrontal cortex and the right limbic system. And the kinds of words that light up the right hemisphere and help those fibers grow, which we can actually see on fMRIs, we can see what kinds of words light up the areas that need to be lit up to let these fibers grow, are words that are like emotionally meaningful. Attachment is formed through emotionally meaningful experiences of being accompanied with warmth and precision. When we accompany somebody with warmth and precision, we care about how they feel and we try to put words to it as best we can understand. And we also are thinking about context. Of course, this person is sad or of course this person is angry. And we begin to, with these words and concepts, 
we're, we're supporting the growth of those neurons where the prefrontal cortex gets to reach inside the brain for the amygdala, really, with these neural arms that are going, oh, Sarah's prefrontal cortex says, oh, Sarah's amygdala, are you scared? Oh, Sarah's amygdala, are you excited? Are you happy? Do you love hanging out with Sharon? Isn't this fun? <laughs> there's a, there's a, an ability to be with whatever the emotional experience is inside the brain. And this is what we're doing that offers people a way to learn it, is we use resonant language, feelings and needs, metaphors, impossible dreams, swearing, it turns out. Uh, oh, I have sometimes <laughs> found out, like when I hit my thumb, a good yeah. swear word always makes my thumb feel better. I don't oh, know. it does. Because there's research that shows that. Absolutely. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. And if you, I don't feel so bad. The research shows that if you use, like my dad always did, instead of fuck to say freaking, it actually doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't create the analgesic impact for your body for to take care of pain. Yeah, my so, favorite one is similar to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> that's my favorite one yeah oh so. terrible story to tell myself the other day I, I was gardening with my grandchild and I did hit my thumb really hard it was purple for white and un, unbeknownst to me it came out yeah. <laughs> it was a reaction guy I didn't there was really not a second between the two it was definitely not a conscious thought and they looked at me and go oh grandma I've never heard you say a swear word before <laughs> I feel so bad. I've damaged my reputation now. <laughs> but all that success, all that, all those years of success, you can count up. <laughs> although, although I think they then all of a sudden realize, yeah, that she's human too, or something along yeah. those lines. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of along those lines, we need to take a quick commercial break. When when we're with Sarah, time flies. We've only got yes. about 20 minutes That's left, bad. and I want to make sure we get that commercial break in, so we'll be right <laughs> back. Welcome back, everyone, from that quick commercial break. I'm Sharon Saylor, as you guys know, and I'm here with the wonderful Sarah Payton. We've just been having a fascinating journey through attachment and understanding attachment styles and what that means. And I'm always fascinated by labels and how we define these things. And I'm going to throw out a couple other labels that can you have more than one label, I guess would be my question. I've heard things like little bits of what you're saying sound a little bit like personality disorder and a little bit of what you're saying could might be interpreted as minor narcissism or something. Can you be all or yeah, yeah, I, I get a little confused in the definitions here of what is Attachment and what attachment. is personality? Yeah, or what is bigger? Or... Yeah, the, the there are correlations between attachment styles and their manifestations in stuff that gets in the way of relationships. So, in narcissism, for example, this is a word that we use to describe a phenomenon where one person really doesn't know that the other person exists. Their needs don't really matter to person A. And this is, if you think about attachment on a kind of a, on kind of a curve where we've got secure attachment in the middle, then you go down on the left, and then you go into avoidant attachment. The farther you go into avoidant attachment, the more you move into punitive and controlling, away from secure attachment. And then as you get out of predictability, you drop into disorganized attachment or traumatic attachment, which really comes with emotional violence and physical violence and addiction and mental illness because all those things make a person unpredictably available and so the farther you get down into unpredictable availability the more it's disorganized so you can get you can slide down the hill into avoidant attachment you can be just a little bit avoidantly attached that's where I was with my friend and him reaching out for my foot. No, don't touch me. And then I was like, I gently, gently brought myself back towards security. And I was like, yeah, you can touch me. It's good. I can get a little comfort from you. That's a movement that you're seeing there. But you can also slide down away from security and be way out on the, on the end. And that's more towards narcissism. And then we're not really in relationship with people. And then we can do really harmful things. The less we're in relationship with people, the more harmful things we do. Mm -hmm. And then you can also slide down on the ambivalent side, on the right-hand side, where you're, you're more and more merged until finally you're subsumed in somebody else. 
And that then has its own disorganization and its own unpredictability once you get below the edge of predictable attachment, predictable responsiveness. For example, as we go down the, the road into what people call borderline attachment, where there's sudden losses of temper and sudden terrors of being abandoned and sudden flashes of paranoia, then that's like down in there in the, in the terror of being lost. In avoidance, we don't worry about losing each other so much because we're so self-sufficient in ambivalence, we're just, we become more and more terrified of losing the other as we get farther and farther. There are certain people running through my head as you say these things. I'm like, oh. Yeah. One of them came to my head that I had always minor narcissists. Their explanation of people to them, are they useful? Yes, that's a very <laughs> avoidant. I always, I'll put this as an acquaintance. I wouldn't put this in the close because... Yeah, there are times I like talking, they're smart and all that. I enjoy conversation, but I still keep that idea in my head. It's, I don't really like just being useful. <laughs> no, it's not very interesting. It's not relational. It's absolutely not interesting to me at all. But yet I know that I've heard them say, not about me, but just in conversations we have, because I think people who watch the show know that I love tangential conversations. And <laughs> a couple of times over the 20 years I've known this person, the term like, oh, people are useful or they're not. And I'm like, wow, that is a really weird thing to say in my book. In my yeah, book, right, really right. Weird you, yeah, exactly. So now we've gotten to touch all four of the attachment styles. We've gotten to touch the organized ones where people have predictability in their availability, secure, avoidant, and ambivalent. And now we've started to say, okay, and there's also this completely unpredictable area of disorganization which has lots of interesting implications because ambivalent attachment is closest to secure attachment. It's easiest to heal. It's harder to heal the, out of that very cozy insulation layer. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to heal from ambivalent attachment because we're more emotionally available to be able to receive those messages that go between prefrontal cortex and amygdala. So the work I did, for example, so that my friend could hold my ankle, that was work to <laughs> chisel away the ossified insulation layer that was keeping me from being able to receive comfort. When I could receive comfort, then I can actually strengthen those connections between my prefrontal cortex and my amygdala. I'll actually live longer. If you're avoidantly attached, you live short. You have shorter lifespans than if you're securely attached, which is a very good reason. As avoidantly attached people, we need logical reasons for why we would put ourselves through the trauma and torture of chipping away the insulation layer. But there we go. You have your very good reason now. <laughs> to well, extend your sense. life and improve I'm your just mood. thinking if someone's done the work and they're pretty steady at that, okay, the insulation's tipped away enough. I'm not ambivalent. I'm not avoidant. And trying to be the nice, safe ship in the harbor kind of thing. Are there things that they can do? Your friend didn't really offer any help. It was something you did on your own. That's there was a response and they had to go, <laughs> oh, okay, back off. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there things that people can do to then I get into the world of where I hate where people label other people. Okay, I'm I'm talking myself out of this. <laughs> so would, be, would there be any, it sounds like you were going to ask, is there anything that your friend could do in that moment where you're like, ugh. Right, to make you feel safer or that it's okay. Yeah. One thing is you could say to somebody who doesn't want to be touched, you could say, and I do this all the time when I'm doing session work with people and they have a little child within them in the trauma state who doesn't want to be touched. You're like, oh, how close does it feel comfortable for me to be and accompany you? Do you need me to be two feet away? Do you need me to be 10 feet away? Do you need me to be on Mars? And sometimes they're like, I need you to be outside the bedroom window in this memory. I need you to be out in the hall. Okay, so we're going to close the door and we're going to let you be in there, but we're going to be right here on the other side of the door. Are you doing okay in there? It could be a yes, metaphorical exactly. door, right? It's yeah, not that you're yeah. out, outside your office in the hallway screaming through the door. No, it's more metaphorical, but like my friend could say, oh, is it okay if I'm like five feet away from you? Or 
is it okay if I'm 10 feet away from you? How close can I be? Because I really want to offer comfort, but I know that the closeness might disrupt the comfort that I want to offer. My friend could say something like that. And that's the radical warmth for whatever comes that is the most healing of all the attachment stuff. Is it's like we put a warm layer of earned secure attachment around any kind of attachment reactivity that we have. We're just like, yeah, sweetheart, of course you want space. And then, then we can, my friend Bonnie Badnock says, we have nesting bowls of attachment styles that we have disorganized inside a layer of ambivalent, inside a layer of secure, inside a layer of avoidant, and that we just are in, as we heal, we're moving through the nesting bowls of attachment and moving towards secure. I have a question. One technique that I use, I want to know what your thoughts on it are, or sometimes it's not practical to move five or 10 feet away, but sometimes I found if I just... Can I sit over here on the other end of the bench so you're both exactly. looking the same direction? Yeah, those kinds of questions are really sweet. Yeah, I like that when they don't have to make eye contact with me because sometimes yeah. it's just the emotion it's so true. of eye contact that can cause some reactions. And oftentimes when I take that away, they actually are okay if I'm closer to them than if yeah. I had been yeah. eye contact to eye contact. So true. This is so fascinating. So we're down (laughs) to 10 minutes. I want time to talk about the class you have coming up on attachment because I think that's, it's a fantastic class. I learned so much and I take it all the time because you learn so much as you could tell, just I'm learning here. What are some things that if we've heard ourselves in either of these places, or I guess we've talked about four quadrants, but if we've heard ourselves in these places, what would you say would be some of the first things that we could do to prepare ourselves to continue to explore and grow and heal? I do. Taking my classes is a wonderful possibility and reading the books is a wonderful possibility and watching the YouTubes and watching all of Sharon's episodes because she's securely attached because she's warm and she's predictably available. And but I have so- to tell you why I, I wasn't always that way, everybody. Okay. Sarah showed me there's a roadmap. I can't tell, go back and tell you. I'm sure there was a roadmap, but I was wandering around in the desert a while. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to say there me is too. hope, everybody. There is hope. Yeah. So these kinds of things, exposure to people that we can bear who are warm and precise and have like a, yeah, you make sense. And I think every episode, of your work is yes my dear listeners you make sense and that's one of the things I love about you oh thank you (laughs) maybe because I I just have been trying to make sense of my whole life and then when you get a diagnosis like this it I'm the type of person has to make sense of stuff (laughs) yeah and those diagnoses those moments of trauma actually put us into disorganized attachment and we have to find our way back So a cancer diagnosis or an autoimmune diagnosis or uh, being in a car accident or these big things, these things are big moments and they put us down in a way, I've been thinking about this lately, our attachment to life itself. If life gets too unpredictable and too many bad things happen, we lose our sense of secure attachment with life itself. And then we're down in disorganized attachment with life itself. So this is a big part of the healing journey for folks who are in relationship with autoimmune or any other kind of diagnosis, mental health diagnoses, whatever it is, that's a moment of extreme unpredictability with life. And we need to gradually find our way back toward predictable availability, not predictable bad things. That doesn't increase our attachment and a sense that life wants us that life likes us the metaphor i made when i got the diagnosis to me the metaphor was somebody asked me i says i feel like i'm flying without a net all of a sudden oh yeah and and to me i like metaphors and stories in my head so it was about rebuilding the net you know yeah okay why i can fly with the net now a safety net now (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So that, that that's such a beautiful metaphor because that speaks exactly to this sense of does life want me? Am I going to be safe? Yeah. And 
I think the thing, especially when, when we get a diagnosis and it's a big shock and you go through the process of first off trying to understand the big medical words for me, I didn't even understand the words. It is a whole time. I like the disorganized and the organized idea because it is a whole time of reorganizing everything. And yeah, finding our is, way. Is, is it possible to accompany someone along as they're rebuilding hope or Maybe they might say they never had hope, but it, a hundred percent fascinating yeah. thing to me that would go along with this attachment issue. I had the ma amazing experience, and I think this is true for your show too. I had this amazing experience where somebody said to me, "Can you improve your attachment w with something besides another human? Because humans have been really unsafe for me." I said, "That's why I wrote the book. Your resonant self was to provide." something that wasn't a human that was as warm and understanding as possible for people to be able to make their way without to get used to these ideas before they start to experiment with other people again. And that person said to me, I slept with your book for the first year that I had it. And I was like, yes, how beautiful this is. Like uh, the book providing secure attachment and you make sense just this solid message of you make sense whatever's going on you make sense and i think your show does this for people they can sleep with you <laughs> metaphorically <laughs> metaphorically <laughs> or also physically because with a, s a sound you can turn it on and you can fall asleep and you can have people's voices in with you, accompanying you. So absolutely, you asked if it wasn't possible to accompany people. Yes. From afar, the way you and I do it, or we can do it with our very closest people too, with grandchildren and children, partners. The sound part makes sense. And Michaela shared with us on her interview with us was that the people sometimes chastise themselves if they have to go to sleep with the television on or the radio on or something like that with noise. Mm. And she was talking about that can actually provide a lot of comfort and people <sighs> shouldn't beat themselves up over that mm. as they're working through that process. If they're like, I should be stronger. Why do I have to sleep with... Maybe their bed partner doesn't like that the TV's on or something. And I can just see where that could be a real problem. I like yeah. sleeping with a book. Nobody would know really... Your bed yeah. part could care less if it was a book, right? <laughs> no, sometimes we just need these. We need these supports and buffers. They're good for us. Absolutely. Now, I want to make sure we get plenty of time to talk about the class that's coming up and when it is, because I know this is an evergreen show. Sarah offers this periodically, so this isn't a one-time thing, but the quicker you jump on it, the <laughs> happier you'll be. Uh, I know from true experience. So tell us about the upcoming class you have on. Yeah, we have a, an upcoming class that meets about once a week from July 22nd to October 7th at 1.30 Pacific time, but also it's available in recording. It's called Healing Attachment Wounds. And not only will you get everything that Sharon and I just spent this time talking about in more detail, but you'll also get the chance to do processes and exercises to begin to feel into how to change your attachment style from avoidant towards, towards secure, from ambivalent towards secure, from disorganized towards secure. And so it's experiential, it's warm, it's lovely. It is. And I want to say this is 2024 for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Give your website so they know how to sign up, where to sign up. And then also they can bookmark that in case they need to take one of the later times that you offer the class. Yeah. And then or if you want to get recordings. Oh, yeah. If you want to get the online. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Class is called Healing Attachment Wounds. It's on sarahpayton.com. And the link you click on is Learn with Sarah. And then you scroll down to the July 22. And there you are. You can sign up right there. And Peyton is P E Y T O N. Okay. Yeah. Like <laughs> so <Nanny. it's> <laughs> S A R A H P E Y T O N dot com. And that's fantastic. Now we just have a few minutes left, probably three or four minutes left. And I want to open it up to I love how your brain works. So just what's on the top of your brain that you're feeling compelled to share with us? I made a note for some things that I promised to say. And one was that we have two parents. So we'll have a different attachment style with each parent. 
So we'll have a secure attachment with a mom and avoid an attachment with our dad or secure attachment with our or ambivalent attachment with our mom and secure attachment with our dad or disorganized with a mom and secure with a dad. It just depends on each of them and how they are with us as kids. That sounds like a whole new show, Sarah. We're going to bookmark that one. So what yeah, else? Yeah. And the, the other thing is that we talked about, we talked about grownups switching their attachment styles when they got into a relationship with a securely attached person, a romantic partner. But little kids, when they're adopted, they'll change their attachment style. So if we get a little kid who's been traumatized in their family of origin and they come into our house in foster situation or an adoptive situation, they'll switch to being attached with us in our attachment style, whatever it is that we're able to offer them. So that's cool too, to know that little kids change even faster than adults. It doesn't take five years. I remember the day, I may have told you this story before, but I love this story. We had an adopted boy who came to us when he was 15 years old and had terrible trauma. And whenever he, thought of it, he just kept getting arrested, he would just get arrested. He would just like walk down the street and get arrested. And we would go to the police office and we dealt with the courts and we just, just kept hanging in there. When he'd been with us for three years, I think, four, he, was, he came at the end of his 14th year. So he was like the end of his 16th year, 17 years old. First time the policeman brought him home. Instead of arresting him, he had softened enough that he wasn't presenting the demeanor in the world of being a bad kid who needed to be arrested with all that defiance and toughness. Instead, he picked him up and brought him home. And I was like, oh my God, his attachment style has changed. So that was like two or three years for a teen. So for those of you who are out there, adopting and fostering just want to give you some love and hope and a shout out to to you for for changing kids lives absolutely oh my gosh we could have gone so much deeper but we're out of time i'm totally fascinated by attachment style and it's such a gift when you have these people i love this term a friend said this to me years ago uh, but it was about having you're the safest person in my world kind of oh, people yeah. in your world where it's nice and safe and you're always those home. <laughs> yeah, know? those are our secure attachments. Yeah, and we what I love about those and I want people to understand is a lot of those people are very different from me. They don't, this doesn't mean that your, your attachment style like means like your twins. A lot of the people I feel are safe people, my safest people in my world each one of them is quite unique. They, they're so I want people to understand that's not really about oh, uh, personality being identical or anything like that. It's really a different topic, and we just barely scratched the surface. So go yeah, to sarahpayton.com. Yeah, sarahpayton.com, and I'll have the link at understandingautoimmune.com. And also, if you are listening and watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. We're really trying to grow our reach and be able to bring this message out that you are not your diagnosis. You can really thrive back 10 years ago, believe it or not. I'm going to be doing a show really soon on 10 years, what I've learned in the 10 years of autoimmune. But I was given terrible statistics back then. And if I had believed those, I probably wouldn't be here now sharing with you on the show, nor doing the 10 years of shows. But anyway, I just want everybody to understand, come along with this. And if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, which is Understanding Autoimmune, you can find it there. Please do. That helps the algorithms and helps us grow and get our message out bigger. So everyone, love you all. Have a great week, whatever your adventures. Thank you so much for taking the time to oh. join with us again. I love how I love her and I love how her brain works. <laughs> so anyway, everyone, like I said, have a great week, whatever your adventures. Join me next week for another brand new episode. Enjoy. Fantastic. Wonderful.